I don't think that I could ever possibly describe exactly what that scene looked like. You go into an overdrive that you don't even know you have. And you're gonna do what you have to do, no matter what's exploding around you, no matter what you realize, how many people were lost, no matter when you start to realize that you were two feet away from being killed yourself. I'm Lieutenant Scott Maxwell, retired, FDNY, rescue company number three. I got hired on the fire department in 1988. I got promoted to Lieutenant June of 2001, where I worked in the 11th Division in Brooklyn. Grabbed a cup of coffee about 7 a.m., kind of sitting around watching the news. Over my shoulder, we see a plane run into the World Trade Center. They start to call all the engine companies and truck companies from Manhattan. At first, we thought it was a small plane, but we quickly realized that it wasn't. We still wasn't sure whether it was uh, terrorism or not, but then we found out that yes, it was, because the second plane hit. They started to send all the Brooklyn companies. We all seemed to join together on Flatbush Avenue, and we were heading towards the Brooklyn Bridge. There was probably 10 fire trucks in a row, all from those surrounding communities in Brooklyn. I get a call over the department radio to redirect for another fire. Now, this is the biggest fire of my life. I was very, I was not happy to be going to this, to this other fire. All it was was smoke blowing across the uh, river. So they released me from that, and now I am five minutes behind those other fire trucks that were going over the Brooklyn Bridge. Just as we are coming out of the back side of the tunnel, the South Tower collapses. The chauffeur actually has to skid the truck as we're coming out of the tunnel. We didn't know, because we couldn't see, that the uh, tower had collapsed. I jump out of the fire truck, and I walk in front of the fire truck because there's literally hundreds and hundreds of people who are fleeing the collapse, and I'm sending them through the tunnel. North Tower was still on fire, and unfortunately, I was witnessing people um, jumping for their lives and landing literally hundreds of yards away from me. As I'm watching this happen and explaining to my guys what tools and where I think that we need to go, I look up and the North Tower just collapses in front of me. At that point, I literally gang-tackle my crew behind the rig. Some of us got under it, some of us ducked behind it. As the debris starts to hit the ground, some of the debris starts to hit the truck. I just can remember laying there with this really strange, serene feeling in my body that this was it, I'm gonna, I, am, I am about to die. Five, six, seven, 10, 15 seconds goes by, the sound stops, completely silent. The cloud, that same cloud now has us. I can't see anything. I start to call out, who's here, who's here? One, two, three, four, hey, where am I? All six of us survived. Of the 10 fire trucks that we were with on the way to the fire when we got redirected, Every one of those guys was killed. I carried a little phone in my top pocket, and cell phones, were, they weren't new, but there was no service. But I kept dialing anyway. I kept it in my hand, and every couple, half an hour or whatever, I would take it out of my pocket, and I would dial it. Finally, somewhere, I guess probably around 4 o'clock, the uh, phone went through, and my Wife's secretary picked up the phone. I said, this is Scott Maxwell, I'm still alive, and I don't know when I'm gonna be home. And I kind of hung up on the lady. And to this day, she's still very angry with me. She's like, no, wait, I'll find your wife, I'll find your wife, but I didn't have time for that. I just wanted to convey home in that two seconds of phone time that I was gonna get that I was still alive. We were spent emotionally, physically, my eyes had been cleaned out three or four times. My crew, everybody 
was completely exhausted. One of the other lieutenants in 219 put me in the car, bought me a six pack of beer, and said, come on, I'll take you home. My wife was home and we saw each other for the, you know, I walked in the house and by that time, all the rest of my neighbors started to uh, All my other neighbors started to, to uh, come out of their houses. And I remember walking into the house, picking up my flag, coming in out, jamming it into the holder, going back into uh, the house, spending a moment, and then my wife drove me to the hospital to get my eyes cleared out. A heart full of questions that have when this first happened, I, um, I went and sought out a, a friend of mine who survived the Battle of the Bulge. And I asked him, Mike, what is this I'm feeling? Why, I, I just can't process what I'm doing here. And he said, Scotty, he said, when we were fighting in World War II, we would advance through the lines and if somebody went down, um, we would keep advancing and a medic would come and get him and we would just continue on. The difference between you, me and you is you got to go back and you got to get your guys. Incredible task. When you're surrounded by nothing but shadows. To lose eight guys from one firehouse, there's only 25 guys that work here. It's devastating. Out of the 343 firemen that were killed, I personally knew 117 of them. The amount of human loss can only be compensated by other humans. We didn't want them being picked up by a crane and dumped into a dump truck. So we did, we did it by hand. I never thought I'd be sitting here 20 years later, but nobody would go back and change anything that we did. These guys are dedicated, brave, and I'm proud of them. As lost as the light seems, the sun 